Kia ora koutou. Uh, ko tēnei tōku pēpeha pōtō, uh, ko Kunani Mount Wellington tōku maunga, ko Waka Rera Rangi tōku waka, ko Horana tōku iwi, ko Tim Temenso tōku ingoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I would like to bring begin this event with a karakia, short karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mākina kina ki uta, kia mākina kina ki tā. E hi ake ana te atakura, he tio he huka, he hau hu. Tihe Maoriora. Welcome everybody to this event um, that's being held in the lead up to the 2023 election, Health Policy Under the Microscope. I'm Tim Tembensel, and for those that don't know me, I teach and research uh, health policy implementation, health systems based in the, in the School of Population Health here in the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. And I also do the occasional column on health policy for the New Zealand Doctor magazine. Um, now, brief tonight, before I introduce the panel, is to put the health policies of the most prominent political parties under the microscope. We want to delve into what might happen if such policies were adopted, and what are some of the consequences, and what would be some of the challenges in making them real. This event is an initiative of Kitapai uh, Tafiti, Aotearoa uh, New Zealand's Health Reform Collective, which is a brand new um, uh, transdisciplinary community based within the University of Auckland. Uh, and uh, I'd really like to thank Jamie King, who I'll introduce in a moment, for being the uh, the power behind uh, this this wonderful initiative. And there's and you're going to hear more about this over the coming months or the coming weeks, I think. Uh, so stay tuned with what, what we're up to. Um, so Kitapai uh, Tafiti um, monitors the implementation of health reforms in New Zealand and aims to inform and engage the public in dialogue about how the changes will impact them and their communities. The event has also been co-sponsored by the university's Public Policy Institute, and here I'd uh, like to acknowledge Suzanne Woodward, who has done an enormous amount in helping uh, this event get off the ground uh, from the Public Policy Institute. I think we were partners in crime with a similar thing about six years ago, the 2017 election. Um, while I'm acknowledging people, I'd love to acknowledge uh, Liz Hooking, who has uh, been part of events management uh, for this event, and these sorts of things can't take place without her expertise and problem-solving abilities. Um, so thank you, Liz. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing the panel. And as you will see, we have a, um, two of our panelists on Zoom. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Esther Willing. Esther is the head of the Kōhatu Centre for Hauru Māori at the University of Otago. So she's beaming in from Dunedin. And her research focuses on the way in which health policy in the health system can improve Māori health outcome, outcomes in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Esther's PhD on child immunisation policy is from the University of Auckland. Uh, Sir Colin Tukui Tonga is the director of the Research Centre for Pacific and Global Health at the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences here. Sir Colin is a former chief executive of the Ministry of Pacific Island Affairs and uh, Director of Public Health for the Ministry of Health, uh, as another of his former jobs, and also once was uh, the Coordinator of Surveillance of Non-Communicable Diseases for the World Health Organization in Geneva. Um, now, panelists who are here in person, Paula Lawgilly is Professor of Health Economics with FMHS and with the Faculty of Business and Commerce. And her research spans the determinants of health and healthcare, economic evaluation, and outcome measurement. And much of her research uh, currently focuses on cancer and more recently on long COVID. Jamie King is Professor of Health Law at the University of Auckland's Faculty of Law. Uh, and since arriving in 2021, was it? 
the university. Um, Professor King's research has uh, explored issues at the intersection of population health, the environment, ethics, law, and policy. And she also continues to examine the ways in which the law affects people's health and access to affordable and equitable healthcare. And finally, I'd like to introduce our MC for this evening, Dr. Sarah Bickerton. And Sarah is also from the Public Policy Institute um, in the Faculty of Arts. And Sarah is a public policy researcher and research lead for Toha Toha Aotearoa Commons. So um, before I hand over to Sarah to ask some questions, we wanted to set the scene and examine the broader context, the broader picture behind um, the 2023 election. So, as I mentioned, we last conducted an event like this just before the 2017 election. And that seems like a different century. So much has changed, particularly over the last four years. So few here need reminding of the enormous impact of COVID on society. And in terms of public health and health services, its impact have been equally profound, but often in unexpected ways. The response to the pandemic revealed to much wider, wider audiences the enormous potential of our under-resourced Māori and Pacific health providers. The pandemic also highlighted with great effect the limitations of having a health workforce fundamentally designed around mutually exclusive scopes of practice. Now, around the time that the Labour New Green New Zealand First Government came into power after the 2017 election, vote health uh, was $16.8 billion. I'm going to throw a few figures at you. Um, and in the current financial year, it's $26.5 billion. What does that mean? Well, after adjusting for inflation, that's nearly a 30%, nearly, uh, just under 29% increase in public or government health spending over six years, which historically is a very, is a high increase even though sometimes it seems as though this money hasn't even touched the sides. In decades to come, we may look back at the year 2022 and see the creation of Te Akafaiora, the Māori Health Authority, as a year to rival 1938, the introduction of the Social Security Act, or 1974, the introduction of ACC, or even 1993, which was the birth date of Pharmac. Um, 2022 may go down as uh, equally important in historical significance. We don't really know yet whether it will um, and whether it marks a significant sh historical shift in the centralization of control over publicly funded services or whether it will just be marked whether it will just mark one end of the swing of the pendulum between decentralization and centralization which we might end up back at the other end. Um, before too long. Now, in every election, it pays to keep things in perspective. So we need to ask to what extent significant policy changes are actually flagged in election campaigns. So if we take the creation of Pharmac in 1993 under National, or the ab abolition of district health boards in 2022 under Labor, neither of those things featured strongly in the preceding election campaign. Although both changes were consistent with the winning party's direction of travel. And who would have predicted that after the 2017 election, the Labor Party would actually implement the very same policy on cheaper primary care fees um, that the National Party campaigned on, rather than implementing its own policy. So we need to take some of what goes on in election campaigns with a grain of salt. But this isn't to say that election campaigns and party platforms on health don't matter. For all parties, there's a tension between pitching policies that signal a particular value base and ideological direction and pitching policies that appeal to undecided voters who don't really identify strongly with any party. Generally, Labor and National pitch most strongly to the undecided and this generally means that they propose incremental changes, uh, but with those changes have more tangible details. Most of the parties this campaign picked up on health workforce shortages, issues of access to health services, a whole range of health uh, of access issues. 
And in 2023, there's a fairly extensive overlap between the two largest parties, National and Labor. And many issues, it's hard to split them, particularly in areas such as addressing workforce shortages, promoting more accessible mental health services for young people. And it's also hard to see major differences in how the larger parties will address the funding of primary health care. Many of the issues where there are larger differences between Labor and National will cover in our panel. ACT and the Greens traditionally place more emphasis on signalling their distinct values to attract voters from the right and the left who are looking for something bolder. And therefore, they can be expected to use broader brush strokes. And the Greens' big pitch this year has been to extend coverage of oral health services to all adults, which would be funded by a wealth tax. ACT in 2023 is adding quite a bit of flesh to the bones of some of its proposals, particularly its uh, the one announced yesterday for a new medicine strategy. I'm not sure uh, whether many people have picked up on that yet. But another significant mention goes to their policy to change the Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission into an organisation that um, commissions mental health services. The Party Māori most significant uh, policy proposal this campaign is to introduce a Māori health card in which public funding follows the Māori patient rather than health provider organisations. Were people aware of this one? Mm, okay, it's there. Um, so that tells you a bit about media coverage, I think, of election campaigns. Um, this idea actually has some family resemblance to ideas proposed by centre-right parties in the 1990s. So there's always some surprises in election campaigns. That's the beauty of what some commentators refer to as the policy primeval soup, in which different policy ideas recombine and mutate across generations. New Zealand First has called for a much broader inquiry into the COVID response. Um, and they are the only party that seeks to repeal the um, recently passed Therapeutic Products Act. And they have also thrown in a couple of specific ideas about providing more funding for Hone Hathe St John Ambulance and Plunkett. So more broadly, looking at the range of party platforms of health gives a great historical view of what's hot and what's not in what political scientists call the public agenda. And there's some interesting newcomers in 2023, including the strong interest in public coverage of oral health services for adults. And I'd say workforce shortages uh, have been there before, but not at the level we're seeing in this campaign. But it's also important to see what does not appear on the agenda. Some notable absences include Pacific Health, Pacific Health inequities, at least in the party material that's easily accessible on the web. Another one is access to and quality of and workforce shortages in aged and residential care, um, which actually was a big issue in Australia's election in 2022. There's a little mention of um, health information technology where we do have major issues and problems, although you could argue that the audience for that is more an insider audience. And when it comes to public health, the Greens and the Opportunities Party are calling for stronger regulation on en energy dense food and on alcohol, but Labor, National and ACT have not flagged anything in these uh, regarding these issues. Although National Spokesperson on Health, Dr Shane Retty, may have opened the door on a sugar tax in some of his recent media comments. So in this evening's panel, we won't get the chance to cover every corner of the election campaign. Um, so apologies in advance if we don't get to talk about your own specific topics of interest. One proposal we definitely won't be covering, at least in detail, is National's proposal to build a third medical school. Uh, and the reason is simply, that all the panellists are from institutions that have a specific interest in the outcome of that issue. Um, we plan to run the panel until about uh, 6.35 or 6.40, and then there will be the opportunity to address audience questions. For this, we're going to do this a little bit differently. We're going to use Slido, and you can see the um, slido.com uh, address. You can just tap into that, use the ID number, and that way you can just enter whatever question you like. Suze is going to curate them and then pass them on to the panel um, in, in about 45 minutes time. Um, so 
I think that's all I need to cover at the moment. I don't need to do health and safety. Everyone's familiar with this building and how to get out of it. Um, so I'm going to, unless I've forgotten anything, I'm going to pass on to Sarah as our esteemed MC. Thank you, Sarah. Um, kia ora, uh, ko Sarah and Hendrika Bickerton, toko ingwa. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Hendrika Bickerton. You may get one of those moments where you realise you're the most junior person uh, out of the, um, I think I've got professors around me and um, a sir. And um, and so I end up um, like wondering as a, just a, a lecturer of public policy, what my role is here and uh, being such as, as an MC. So I hope that I won't fail about that. As we know, lecturers are notorious for their inability to talk. Given I'm about to turn 50 next year, I don't know how much I can make that claim. Um, also, I apologize for the slightly husky voice, which I think is apt, given this is a health policy um, panel. I um, lost my voice thanks to a chest, code over, chest cold over the weekend, which given I knew that this was coming up this week was excellent timing. Um, so I apologize if I sound a little bit throaty and coughy. Um, uh, but anyway, you're not here to listen to me. You are here to listen to our amazing panelists. So um, I think we'll leap straight into um, Esther. Um, I'm going to address the first question to you. Um, starting off with one of the largest areas of health policy, the structure of the health system, including the future of Te Aka Whaiora, um, what do you see as the major differences in the proposed reforms from the different parties? Okay, starting off with the big ones. I think um, it's quite clear that Labour, the Greens, and Te Pāti Māori all strongly support Te Aka Whaiora, strongly support the funding of Te Aka Whaiora and the, the goals and objectives that Te Aka Whaiora is trying to achieve within the new health system. And National and ACT take the opposite stance to that. Um, both have been very vocal from the creation of Te Aka Whaiora um, in the, the start of the health reforms over a year ago, that um, that they would be campaigning on a policy change here and disestablishing Te Aka Whaiora. And I think what they're really saying with that position on, on Te Aka Whaiora within our new health system is they want to see a return to the status quo that we had under the, the old health system. And so they use phrases like one health system for all New Zealanders, but as a Māori health researcher, as a Māori academic working in this space, um, looking at health systems and its out, um, the impact of our previous health system on Māori health outcomes, what that's actually saying is um, a return to our health system failing Māori. And so our previous health system struggled to improve access to health services for Māori whānau, for Māori populations. We saw um, Māori health inequities increase or remain stagnant in a lot of places within the previous health system. And the health system, health um, and disability system review really highlighted the need for a different approach to improving Māori health outcomes in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and that's what Te Aka Whaiora has set out to do. And I think we're one year into the establishment of Te Aka Whaiora. It's a new institution that's had to um, start, set up and hire staff and establish policy positions from scratch and it needed to do that because the previous direction within the health system wasn't meeting the needs of Māori. So its purpose is different to Te Whata Ora. Te Whata Ora inherited the previous DHB structures, um, hospitals, staff, processes and although the last year there have been a lot of changes in that space, that's quite a different situation to Te Aka Whaura, which had to create those the entire um, structure and how they would actually implement the changes they want to do. And so I, I think at the very least we need Te Aka Whaura to embed within our health system over a couple more years to be able to start demonstrating um, how having a Māori health authority is going to benefit our health system overall and how it's going to uphold Māori rights to equitable health outcomes. And I think if um, National and ACT continued with what they're stating they want to do if, if elected to government. I think we would see um, you know, the progress that might have happened over the next couple of years um, 
made it invisible. Once again, Māori rights to health and Māori um, health inequities will become invisible within the health system and um, Te Whatu order serving the population as one population. We know Māori have different health needs, we know Pacifica people have different health needs, and that's going to require different approaches in terms of how our health system delivers health services to meet those needs. And that, I think, is um, the purpose of Te Aka and why it's important to retain Te Aka Whaiora, um, going forward. Terrific. Um, anyone want to do a follow-up answer as well? Not actually an answer, but actually an additional question for Esther. Sure. Has anybody suggested more funding for Te Akafaiora? Te Pāti Māori have suggested more funding for Te Akafaiora. Um, they want to see it, um, the investment in Te Akafaiora kind of reaching the standard that the original recommendations of the Health and Disability System Review made. Um, and so I think there yeah, that makes a really strong stance of what of why they think Te Akafaiora is important in terms of meeting Māori health needs and Māori health rights. Okay, um, moving on to the second question. Um, Paula, um, ACT has proposed uh, major, a major funding review for PharmAC. Um, what do you make of this and what do you make of other parties' stances on the organisation and its role? Kira, thanks, Sarah. Um, I thought I'd take the liberty of giving you a little health economics lesson um, and remind you what PharmAC is. Um, and I think that's because it gets distorted, distorted what it is. So they're our procurement agency. Um, they are the budget holder for medicines and they're the decision maker for medicines. Um, and so they have to fund treatments within their budget. They can't go outside their budget, right? It's just like us having our household budget. Um, uh, they were one of the first health technology agencies in the world and actually have a very high standing in that space. Um, but that also means that they can get compared to other um, agencies. So I spent a lot of my working career in the UK um, and watching what NICE um, and how NICE gets critiqued in England, right? HCA is very easy to critique. Um, and, the, and the unique thing about, um, well, the comparison between NICE and even um, PBAC in Australia, where I've worked as well, and Pharmac is that neither Australia or um, England have a budget for pharmaceuticals. So when they make decisions, somebody else bears the opportunity cost. And so that's what's quite unique about New Zealand is that any decision that Pharmac makes, it has to make within its budget, right? So it, it places a different paradigm on it. Um, and because of the critique that Pharmac experiences, right, it's a um, I don't think there's a week that goes by where there's not something about people waiting for drugs and indeed um, um, waiting or dying while waiting for drugs. Um, uh, there has been a review of Pharmac and uh, it's important to acknowledge that in that review, their independent review, um, it highlighted issues with a lack of governance, a lack of transparency, a lack of equity in some of their decisions. Um, and there was a number of recommendations made, um, including uh, a, a, a need for a revised system-wide medicine strategy. Um, and I know personally from my colleagues that work in Pharmac that they are um, undertaking some of the reviews in the space and they're trying to they're trying to change their methods and, and um, work within this. Um, uh, and so I <laughs> was surprised when I started doing this because I, I think a lot of what we're seeing, um, a sound bites in the media. So I was very surprised when, and I think Tim was surprised when I showed him today, um, Pharmac actually have a proper doc, Pharmac, um, act, sorry, have, a, have an actual medicine strategy document, um, which I've been pouring over today. So it was released yesterday. Um, and I guess what surprised me most is um, I was pleased to see that some of it was sensible. Um, <laughs> uh and uh, particularly, it talks about a, medicine, a need for a medicine strategy, which is actually something that came out of the Pharmac review, right? So there's not necessarily some new ideas. I mean, I think it's also important to acknowledge perhaps why there is a document, a four-page document in small font, quite a lot written, is that they have a new candidate, um, Tom Stevenson, number four on ACT list, possibly likely to get in. Um, and he has spent the last 15 years in Australia working for pharmaceutical companies, right? So he's in this space and I read this and I, I can see where this is coming from. 
um, I, I suspect it was outsourced to a consultancy to write the thing, but, and so they're, they're calling for quite an overhaul of the medicine space um, and, and, um, and requesting analyses of unmet need it even refers to the economics of pharmaceutical markets. Like, so these are like music to the ears of a health economist. You know, we need to be doing more in this space. Um, it, it refers to um, ad possibly adapting the Pharmac model, which I'll get to in a moment, and um, and the possible role for private insurers to negotiate lower prices, which I think is an interesting space. How could a private insurer negotiate better than Pharmac, who are quite well known for their negotiating skills? Um, uh, and, it, and it has a reference, an interesting reference to performance reporting and benchmarking. Um, and this is, um, and, and there was an interview of, a couple of weeks ago with Todd Stevenson who talked about the need that Pharmac needs to look at productivity and start looking at productivity. So who is receiving healthcare and are they being productive as a result of receiving their healthcare? Um, um, and then there's a further element about speeding up regulatory approvals. So within one week of a drug getting approved in two other countries, it needs to be approved here. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so despite all the words on the page, there's no costings and no financial modeling, but I mean, I'm not sure anyone's surprised about that. Um, and so what do I think would happen if this went ahead? I think it would exacerbate the inequalities we're already experiencing. So if drugs got approved by meds, um, MedSafe, then anybody who could afford it could get access to it. Um, uh, uh, particularly if it was going to be then through the um, anybody who had insurance and it was going to be part of the insurance policy as well. Um, if you don't happen to be economically active, which might be because you're old, because you're young, maybe on a benefit, then it might be that ACT doesn't, doesn't have a, a view on the fact that you are deserving of medicines because you're not making that contribution to society. Um, and it's not to say that we there, there, the inclusion of productivity loss doesn't happen. It happens in the Netherlands, um, but it's more nuanced. And I think it, it requires careful consideration before we were going to introduce it, um, particularly when we're in a space where our reforms are looking at equity not looking at, at productivity. Um, so that's so, so there's kind of a surprise. I'm welcome to share this um, with anybody who wants to read it or or use it to mop up some coffee. Um, uh, just a quick word on what some others are doing in this space as well. So National has said that it will fund 13 cancer drugs that are not available in um, New Zealand but are available in Australia. Uh, and there's been a fair bit in the press about what that means um, and actually whether we even have um, the infrastructure to fund, to, to deliver these new medicines. So there's a question of should the should the, that funding actually be put into delivering care versus, you know, staff on the ground versus delivering medicines. Um, because they've said they're going to remove the prescription charge, which we'll get to, they're going to reinstate the prescription charge, which we'll get to, um, uh, they've already indicated they're going to put aside um, $70 million a year to fund these 13 medicines. So they've shown their hand to pharmaceutical companies about what they're willing to pay. And so what that does is takes away um, Pharmac's ability to negotiate. Um, and I think that's the, that's the little bit about that kind of undermining this, this independent agency. Um, National just yesterday also announced it's going to fund continuous glucose monitoring, um, but Pharmac has already requested tenders in this space, so it's already going into that area, but because they said they'll fund it, what do you think will happen to those tenders? We already know you're going to pay us, we won't necessarily give you the best price because we know you're going to fund it. So again, it's about undermining them. Mari, Party, Party Mari, Greens and Labour have said they're going to increase funding. Um, and I guess what concerns me most about all of these things is you can put a lot more money into paying for pharmaceuticals, but if you don't put money into the decision-making space, we're still going to take a long time to make decisions. Um, and so I know there are vacancies, there are vacancies all through the health system, right? There are, we'll, we will talk about workforce shortages. There are vacancies in nurses and, and um, doctors and, and midwives, but there is vacancies in pharmac. Um, and one of the reasons that they take a long time 
to make decisions and they take a long time to change their methods is because they're completely under the pump trying to make decisions. And so I think what perhaps would be better is to put some of that money into paying for um, medicine into actually um, informing the decisions. Jamie, did you want to um, follow on from that at all? Uh, no, I think that was really no, okay. Um, okay, um, uh, throwing things a little bit more open, um, the question of health targets um, has re-emerged as a focus. Um, given what we've learned from our past experience of these, um, what are our thoughts here? Um, Tim? I can lead off the that yeah. if you like. Um, right, uh, those who know um, sorts of things that I've been researching over the last 10 or 12 years will know this is a, a topic I say dear to my heart, but at least thought a lot about, and, and Esther um, would probably say the same thing, uh, given that her um, PhD was on uh, the implementation of the immunisation target. So I guess my major take on this is not all targets are the same. Some might be better than others. Um, so um, I might leave... You know, if Esther wants to talk about the one that that, that probably works, um, I'll, um, we can we can get to that later. But um, my concerns are around the re reintroducing the the targets that are around waiting times. Um, there's an enormous body of uh, international literature that talks about the the problems of gaming. Uh, we did some research in uh, into the emergency department target last time it was introduced. And yes, it did um, have some really initial um, positive effects and it did save lives probably in the first 18 months. After that, uh, after uh, staff had run out of productivity improvements, process improvements, that's when the gaming started. So people were being uh, put into short stay wards uh, just to be kept off the target. And... Uh, you know, uh, people with NADs, nurses were, would would often stop the clock to, to say that somebody had been passed on when they're actually still lying there. Um, they did this because they had no other options to meet the target. Um, and so after a while, target figures uh, become less reliable unless there's some sort of inter independent monitoring, um, which which can happen. Um, so if you want to monitor targets and want to have that, uh, more trust in the figures, guess what? You've got to employ more managers and administrators to do that. And I'm not sure that fits the, the, the narrative. Um, so uh, that's basically the take on targets. They can be useful in the short term, but the long-term effects uh, are known to be, you know, sort of have... Uh, problematic and what it does is sort of puts the onus on a particular part of the health system and it takes the focus away from the complexity and the and the interlinking between all the different parts of the system such as the issues in residential aged care which is really one of the major causes of ed crowding um and the thing yeah. and ahead. in the case of the um immunization target that is one area where we know that a health target makes a difference. And so my PhD looked at the um, immunization health target for two-year-olds that ended in 2012, and it showed that the target really focused attention on immunization. It created accountability for immunization coverage at a DHB level. I haven't seen, I think what this proposed target is actually going to be doing is putting accountability on primary care providers, on GPs. And I don't think that's the best approach because what it will do is it will mean that um, practices and GPs that are able to easily meet the target or increase coverage with their population will be getting the financial incentive for meeting that target or improving their coverage. Whereas practices and communities where barriers to accessing primary healthcare is a bigger issue will continue to be disadvantaged. So I actually think the proposed immunization target that nationals put forward could increase inequities for um, low socioeconomic communities, for Māori, um, for Pacifica whānau. Um, I do think that it's important to set a priority for immunization. I think they've picked the easier one at two years old. I think the more ambitious target would have been 95% coverage or 85% coverage at um, five months or eight months old. 
to make sure that babies were protected in a timely fashion, because that's actually the challenge we've had um, over the past 15 years, is even when we're able to increase coverage at two years of age, timeliness for younger babies and children, particularly for Māori babies, was a real big issue. So I think at, on the surface, it looks like it might be a policy that's a bit of an easy win for National. Um, I think they could, if they were going to introduce a target, it could be done in a better way. Perfect. I think that major point about um, both Tim and Esther are bringing up is that idea regarding targets that like not all targets are the same is a really important point. And I think one of the things that you'd have to ask in this context is um, which of the targets is the is the person, the party being in government um, as like devolving responsibility to hear healthcare provider for, because they can say we set the targets they didn't perform um and and and, and the question for you is uh, as voters is to assess um at what point are they setting them up for failing effectively and devolving responsibility when you set up a target um okay shifting topic a little bit um to healthcare services um colin um, the most prominent health policy area in terms of specific policy that has been mentioned so far in the campaign um, has been the expansion of public coverage to oral health services. Um, what are the issues here and uh, do you think the proposal put forward by the Greens and Labour would address problems that have been identified? Uh, kia ora, uh, Sarah and the team. Uh... Anyone who's been working in the health sector in New Zealand will tell you that dental diseases, oral health, has been a major problem for mainly low-income New Zealanders for many years. Yes, we have had uh, some public support for those under 18, but dental illness, uh, dental health, oral health problems is a major cause uh, of morbidity in our country. And the fact that uh, we've not funded uh, oral health services in New Zealand is a historical anomaly, I think. It's a an accident of history. Why do we fund uh, primary care, support primary care, but not uh, oral health? And low-income uh, New Zealanders, particularly Māori and uh, Pacifica folk, are the ones that bear the brunt of this. There is a cost uh, to all of us. Uh, dental health uh, or oral health problems may eventually need general anaesthetic in a hospital or expensive uh, medication. So this isn't just an issue for the individual with an oral health problem. This is an issue for us as a nation, uh, for our health uh, system. What are the issues? Well, I think firstly, it's important to acknowledge that the um, both Labour and Green policies will go some uh, way towards addressing these uh, anomalies and particularly contributing to um, a reduction in inequities. I guess this is an important component of this. The Greens, of course, have proposed free, uh, i.e. publicly funded uh, oral health services for everyone. Um, uh, Labour is a bit more targeted to those under 30 from um, uh, uh, an increase from those under 18 who, who have always had uh, some level of uh, public support. The big policy uh, question, of course, is uh, we have one medical school, uh, sorry, one uh, dental school in New Zealand and, and produces about 60 dentists, I understand, and we rely on an additional 60 from overseas. And so this is the big uh, uh, question. Where will we get the workforce needed to uh, implement this uh, policy? Um, so in summary, my uh, reading is that most people seem to think that this is a good idea to address this uh, long-standing uh, anomaly. It will uh, contribute to a reduction in inequities in, in at least uh, with regard to oral health uh, problems, but there are clearly um, workforce uh, implications uh, for us as a, as a nation. 
Yeah, no, thanks, Colin. Um, I'm going to swap around the order of my questions um, on the fly because I realise we haven't heard from Jamie. Um, primary health care has not been featured um, as visibly in the party platforms this election. Um, what do you think is in store for this sector? Thanks, Sarah. Kia ora, everyone. Um, so I think that while primary health care hasn't been uh, really heavily featured, it is in there in some ways. And I think ignoring... Um, primary care at this time is they do it at their own peril, right? We all know that there's a major, major um, crisis happening in primary care in this moment due to workforce shortages, to um, burnout of practitioners, nurses and doctors are working kind of overtime in these moments. And what we're seeing is also that co-pays are too expensive. So access has really been um, limited for many people, and they're not delivering equitable outcomes. And so we've seen these highlights across the board that basically very few people are getting uh, the care that they need in a timely fashion and an affordable manner. And so what we're also seeing is that when we have limited access to primary care, we also have a situation where that puts greater burdens on other parts of the healthcare system. So that increases and exacerbates wait times in the ER. And that's something that's not really going to be handled by any kind of targets, right? We want to be taking care of people earlier, um, you know, earlier in their, in their health process and when they're getting sick. So what are the different parties saying about primary care? What are we seeing them say? So they're, they're basically trying to tackle the challenges of primary care in three different ways. The first is that they're trying to add additional funding into the system. Second, they're trying to extend free coverage uh, to different portions of the population. And third, they're trying to add in additional providers and get them from any different direction that they can. So in terms of additional funding, ACT has promised um, $163 million or a 13% increase in GP funding. And they're claiming that this is the equivalent of about 2.5 million extra GP visits um, in terms of um, per year that they would provide. Labor has already added in the 23-24 budget uh, half a billion dollars to promote um, sector stability in, in primary care, as well as promoting pay equity between primary and community care physicians um, alongside with hospital. And so trying to like square up their pay overall. So that's um, quite an important move. We need to have better pay equity across providers to keep our primary care providers um, in place. The other thing that labor has uh, promised is to allocate about $80 million in additional funding to promote primary care um, for high needs, both high needs areas and high needs populations. And so really trying to focus and target some of their funding, particularly to those groups. The other thing that they've promised is to prioritize uh, examining capitation rates for primary care providers when they look at future funding allocations to really try and bump up pay for primary care providers across the board. In terms of national, they have really focused on um, their incentivizing targets for immunizations. And so they've they've pledged about $52 million um, as part of that uh, immunization targeting scheme. But again, as Esther pointed out, that's only for the primary care or groups that meet those immunization, immunization targets across um, the three areas for, for both um, childhood immunizations up to 24 months, MMR up to age 17, and then influenza vaccines for people over 65. So if you're not, if your primary care group isn't one that has a population that's likely to do that or has trouble accessing primary care, they're less likely to get that funding. In terms of extending free coverage, I mean, this is really in line with what Tim was saying before, how national and labor have really put forth um, very specific policies. The Greens and Tapati Maori and Top have all promised broader coverage um, to all um, to different areas of the population. So, and one of the things that I found in the Greens proposal that was really interesting was that they were trying to transition privately funded healthcare services to fully funded publicly owned services um, and providing free, for free dental care, general practitioner visits, ambulance and emergency services, um, aged care and palliative care. So really trying to broaden out who gets it and really looking at that public private divide. And so, you know, as Paula brought up, I think we're starting to see tensions arise between the public and private system. And we need to be thinking pretty clearly as voters about how the incentives that we're putting in place and what policies we put in place, how that might incentivize providers to move from the public system into the private system and ways that that and what kind of 
uh, outcomes that creates for the public system overall. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, in terms of increasing providers, everybody sort of came up with the same solutions, just different variations on the same theme, right? So they all wanna pay more money to GPs and nurse practitioners and to find ways to make their working conditions better. Um, they also want to increase and improve immigration. Who can we bring in from overseas? That's also sort of a medium term solution. And then they're gonna be training more doctors and nurses. Uh, one thing here is that ACT wanted to allow nurse practitioners to take on additional tasks to ease the um, ease the burdens on general on general practitioners. Uh, I think that we've seen expanding no scope nurse scope of practice go very well in the United States as a policy and a way to ease burdens on um, general practitioner providers. And so I think that's like quite a sensible move there. Um, in terms of labor, they have promised to increase the number of GPs trained uh, by upping it from 200 to 300 per year, um, as well as adding general practitioners to the green list, which would mean that they would automatically, upon immigrating to New Zealand, they would be they would be given residency status and they would be given twenty thousand dollars to move here. So, really trying to attract general practitioners from overseas and making real efforts to continue to grow the Pacific, the Maori and Pacific workforce. Um, Tipati Maori is looking to have uh, fees free medical and nursing training. And so that's a really positive uh, move in trying to get more uh, Maori and Pacific uh, nurses into place and, and providers. Um, in terms of the Green Party, they really want to meet uh, union demands in terms of pay parity, working conditions, other things to really trying to make that working space for general practitioners a much more uh, tolerable and better space. Um, and so what we're seeing here is a, is a major shift. And I think that we need to be concentrating so much on how we take care of our primary care services that we're offering in an attempt to get the foundation of healthcare here, um, to a better place so that we don't have so much stress being put on, on EDs and hospitals and specialist providers. So I think we're likely to see, um, more providers overall and hopefully better working conditions. Thank you. Perfect. Um, I mean, we're already like way over time, but who who knew that academics would want to be long winded? Um, never happens. Um, okay, but I'll, I'm going to uh, throw back to Paula. Um, the debate about prescription co-payments has emerged as a classical one around universal versus targeted subsidization. Um, um, what are the merits and disadvantages of the parties' positions here? And remember time. Yeah. Sorry, we want to educate. Um, <laughs> that's the difference. Um, so just a reminder, and, and anyone who's been to the GP and then got a prescription filled, as of July, it has been free. Um, so there's been no prescription charges since July. So the Greens, um, Labour, Greens, to Party Māori, and notably New Zealand First, um, want to maintain that um, fee, I get this free, free prescriptions, no charges for prescriptions. Um, National wants to reinstate it for those who can afford it, um, which in his example was Christopher Luxon and Chris Hipkins, and, and and I suspect many people in this room. And ACT wants to reinstate it for everybody. Um, now, this is this was a, a rare evidence-based policy when it was actually brought in in July, um, and there's national evidence that shows that co-payments are a barrier, um, and many countries are removing them or reducing them, right? So um, it, it's a huge barrier. It, it probably stops you going to the GP because if you know that you can't then afford the prescription, what is the point of getting you know, a prescription that you can't fill? Um, and there's evidence from the um, Health Survey in New Zealand that shows that Maori and Pacific people are 3.1 or 1.1 times more likely not to get a prescription filled because of the cost, right? So it really is a barrier. And so the, the, there's some beautiful work that was published earlier this year of an RCT, so we're talking like gold standard evidence out of Otago, um, where they trialed people having to pay for their prescriptions, as was the case, or getting free prescriptions. And they found that people that have got free prescriptions were less likely to have a hospital stay and have a sh and if they had a hospital stay, it was going to be shorter. Okay, so the, these are benefits. So it's not just about filling prescription, it's about wider health benefits. Um, so, of course, National wants to reinstate the prescription charge to fund these 13 cancer drugs. Um, 
But what they might find that they're doing is not only are they funding these cancer drugs, but they have to fund people to go to hospital and people to have longer hospital stays, right? Because of, of, of um, the implications of that policy. Um, and, and there's been a lot about the fact that you already could get free prescriptions and, and everybody loves a chemist warehouse. It's a bit like Ikea. Um, you come out from there not only with your free prescription, but also with all these other things you didn't intend on buying, like the Ikea example is candles. You don't know that when you get Ikea here, you'll understand what I mean. So looking forward. <laughs> Jamie knows what I mean. Um, uh, and of course, so the chemist warehouse and countdown, you could get free prescriptions before this. Um, but of course, that supported Australian owned companies and it doesn't support um, your local high street community pharmacies. And interestingly, those small businesses are what ACT wants to support by having um, repealing fair pay agreements, putting a freeze on minimum wage increases and removing our public holidays. So it's kind of interesting where they haven't really drawn the dots between supporting um, your local community pharmacies by offering uh, well, we're maintaining the, the prescription um, uh, free prescriptions. And that's because pharmacists have actually come out and said they really appreciate not having to charge. There is the time cost of having to look up if somebody's got a community services card, if they don't have it with them. And they've even said that what they can now do instead of charging people is actually give people health care, which is probably what they went to university for, right? Um, and so I think that's a really interesting space to think about what are the pros and cons of generating income versus where the savings are in the rest of the system. That was much shorter. Oh, that was well done. <laughs> that was excellent. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over. Um, uh, it's like one of the questions we had is like, just in case we were like running ahead of time um, uh, to move on to the health workforce. Um, um, just a short answer to this one then, surely. Oh, right? Yeah, totally going to be a short answer to it. Like easily fix the health workforce in like five minutes. That'll be excellent. Um, okay, Colin, um, workforce shortages appear to be a problem across all parts of the healthcare system. Um, how do you view the body's positions on addressing these shortages? Well, I think the focus on the workforce is the right thing to do. It is the issue. And, uh, you know, we've seen the senior doctors go on strike uh, for the first time. Uh, in other words, uh, we have a real concern with regard to the inadequate uh, workforce uh, that basically drives uh, systems. So both uh, the Nats and Labor pledging additional medical places. It's important to point out that the Labor Party allocated 50 placements already this year to Auckland and Otago. And Tim has ruled uh, the third medical school uh, off limits. Uh, I have a I have a view on that, but I Tim is going to smack me down, so I won't oh, attempt really? it. So oh. it, it, I think it's encouraging that both the big parties, the major parties, uh, have pledged additional support. Labour three hundred and thirty five uh, new medical placements from twenty twenty seven. 700 additional uh, nurse uh, positions, uh, as well as recruiting more senior staff from OC. So uh, I think it's uh, it's a good uh, development. I rather suspect that, uh, you know, training medical workforce is like turning a big tanker, I think is the, is the phrase. Uh, by the time we get to it, we'll find that we're probably further and further behind because everyone uh, at the moment is looking to recruit uh, and we just don't, we're at the bottom end of the pay and uh, reward uh, system in terms of uh, countries that we compare ourselves with. So anyhow, uh, I think it's uh, commendable. Uh, the National Party clearly has uh, pledged, uh, my understanding is 220 medical places uh, by 2030. So both uh, major parties is planning support, but I rather suspect we'll find ourselves still short of people in due time. Uh, the other important dimension in all of this is to point out that Maori and Pacific, uh, uh, um, we don't have a medical workforce that reflects our communities and we still have a, uh, a Pacific uh, medical 
workforce around 2% and it's been like that uh, for a while. And unless we invest and take some bold decisions to address the uh, diversity of our medical uh, workforce, uh, I think we'll, we'll keep seeing the same um, inadequacies that we've seen for some time. So uh, commendable uh, both parties, uh, but I would uh, encourage people to think uh, very clearly about diversity in our workforce because it does lead to better health outcomes. Go ahead. Yes, thanks. Could I could I just say when I looked at the policies, um, I'm disappointed, or no, not surprised that um, National Act and Labor are also wanting to increase the migrant workforce. And I actually see this as a real short term and it's a solution because otherwise it's unsustainable, unethical, and uneconomical. Um, so my colleagues in the UK, um, uh, they are the senior doctors are on a um, 72 hour strike right now. Uh, there are 40,000 nurse vacancies. You know, this is a global workforce crisis. And for us to try and take them from other countries, you know, because yes, we might pay less than Australia, but we pay more than, you know, India and the Philippines. And the Philippines traditionally overtrains as an export. It, it, it's a con contribution to their GDP. Um, but they now have a shortage. Uh, and so I, what I would like to see and, and what they don't have, and maybe they're still writing their policies so they, you know, they can put this in a policy, which is actually changing the way that we train and, and thinking more of upskilling our workforce. So things like um, non-medical prescribers um, or thinking about what can we do um, with technology. Um, so changing it there. And it might be, you know, and I've written this down, whether it's a new medical school or more places in our current schools, um, or and whether that's the medical school or the nursing school or the population school of population health, um, I'd like to think that we can better understand the workforce needs, right? So let's not just do more of what we're doing, but actually do more of something different. Mm. Yeah, but that's I, I'm hoping you're listening over there, Warwick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and the only thing I'd add to that is um, none of the party yet, and this might be because it would be you know, very odd thing to do in an election campaign, but they might be thinking about it, but nobody's really talking about um, the division of labour within the in, in the health system and scopes of practice. And, um, and I'm pretty convinced that we can't keep going the way that we're going with the existing scopes of practice and uh, uh, the way the cake is divided up. Um, and again, we, we saw in COVID what a few things might look like differently. Of course, there's lots of things to work through there, but I'm really surprised that this uh, is not yet a feature of, of electoral politics, at least. Maybe it's on the fringe. Um, look, oh, yeah, yeah, I was just about to throw to Esther. Um, yeah, particularly around um, Labor's mentioned, bolstering the Māori health work, workforce, Esther. Um, do you think this has legs as it is proposed? And do you have any... Other thoughts on the workforce issue? As someone who um, teaches and supports um, the Māori pathway students in the health professional programs at Otago, there's been there's been a lot of investment and work done in this space by the Labor government and in the previous government before that, governments before that as well. So I think that's building on on progress that's already been made in increasing the number of Māori and Pacifica students into health professional programs. Um, I just wanted to make a point about, I think, what Tim was touching on and, and lessons learned during COVID. And I think there was a real missed opportunity of retaining and upskilling um, Māori community health workers, kaimahi, who were used during the COVID vaccine um, drives to be able to then develop those skills, retain them in the Māori health providers and community health providers and then deploy them working in other areas through, you know, through additional training. And I think that's actually a model that we need to be considering, especially within um, Māori communities and developing the Māori health workforce. It needs to be that alongside an increase in the numbers of, um, of doctors, nurses, midwives, and we need to increase the proportion of Māori and Pacifica working in those spaces. So I think, again, I, I think it, it was a lost, missed opportunity after COVID, um, kind of scaled back, but I don't think that any of the current parties, I think the Greens have talked about training more kaimahi within Māori health providers, but there really hasn't been a focus on um, 
on innovation in this area, different ways of building the health workforce other than increasing the number of migrants, um, which I agree is a real short term solution and, and not something we should actually be strongly encouraging whilst we complain about our health professionals leaving for Australia. Okay, um, we're going to move on to our final topic area, which um, uh, public health. And given we've had um, no really major public health concerns over the past few years, um, uh, we thought a discussion of a couple points in this area might be fruitful, um, to put in a pun, if you know, you know. Um, Jamie, Colin, um, I'm going to start off with you two. Um, what are your thoughts on Labor's proposal to exempt fruit and vegetables um, from GST? Who wants to start? I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> look, I know um, there's, uh, there's some so-called prominent economists uh, think that this is a dumb idea and that the supermarkets would uh, keep the... Uh, profits and it won't really benefit those uh, that it's uh, intended. Uh, it, it does sound to me like these are proclamations from people in a particular position in uh, our society. I can tell you that uh, those folk who struggle to um, make ends meet would appreciate any savings that might go their way. And so I take a positive attitude towards uh, this we 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 in public health we tend to focus on ban this stop that reduce this you know it, and it's all rather party poopers kind of thing you know and it's uh, encouraging uh, once in a while to hear something positive happening so i take a positive uh, view of this uh, proposal uh, the fact is that we what's being offered out there and what people can afford is not what we would say is a good diet and anything to try to uh, encourage consumption of healthy food and veg I think is to be welcome in other words I take a positive view of this uh, development yes the economics of it and the details of course need to be worked out but I I, I think it's a it's an encouraging development uh I agree too. I realize that as a as an economic policy and a way of really addressing the cost of living crisis, it's it's not going to get us across the mark, right? They're talking about saving people about twenty dollars a month, but I completely agree with Colin that it is actually for some people, it's going to make a lot of different. It's going to help them make different choices in the grocery store. I know that it will help me make different choices in the grocery store. There's definitely been moments where I've put back the blueberries because they're, you know, $9, even though I really enjoy them. Right. And so I think this is a, is a positive move. I understand that it may, um, increase challenges with making the GST a little bit less simple, but I think if we have, uh, a GST that is flexible and can allow us to make these kinds of nudges. We want a policy tool that enables us to do those kinds of things. Um, the data suggests that when you look at, there's there was a, a, a good review of a whole bunch of different studies looking at both subsidies on healthy food and taxes on um, unhealthy food. And when you look at them across the board, they do drive behavior change in the right direction. We wanna give people the best opportunity they can to eat as healthy as they can. This goes back to my point about really you know, under underpinning the foundations of health and keeping people as healthy as we can from the outset. And so I'm I'm with Colin. I think this is is a a good bet from a public health perspective. And it's an even better bet if it's married with um taxes on unhealthy and ultra processed foods. And I should say one of those seven economists who was interviewed and asked their opinion on DSC on on uh, um, fruit and vegetables said, find me an economist who supports this and they don't des deserve to be called an economist. So I just kept quiet. Um, but it's because I'm not looking at fiscally, I'm looking at public health benefits of it. Um, and not only is there evidence that it improves, um, increases consumption, it actually it, it improves it in the, in the people who are more disadvantaged, right? So it has an equity implication there. It's just gonna be very difficult to implement which is what I think the other economists are looking at. Tamara Esther, does anybody want to speak against this at all? Yeah, I know I do. <laughs> I know Esther does too. <laughs> I'll let you go, Tim. Oh, no, you go first. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said here, but I think it's being hyped um, as a greater policy in achieving, um, you know, supporting with peak whānau with the cost, the high cost of living and promoting healthy food choices. I think that if you were trying to make changes in this area to GST around the cost of living, um, reducing GST would be a better option, but it's far more expensive, which is why it's not being considered. Um, I also agree with um, the points that we made around promoting health and wellbeing. I think that's a really good good idea, but it does need to be alongside um, regulation of the food industry in, in a whole number of areas. Otherwise, it's going to be just a small drop in the pool in terms of promoting health and wellbeing. So, um, although I, I felt your arguments were compelling, I'm thinking about my position a little bit more now. <laughs> okay, well, I'll stick up my neck a bit further. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I can see the benefits and I agree with, I, uh, sorry, I can see the objectives and I agree with the objectives. I actually don't think it's going to realise those objectives. And uh, base that on, partly on um, something that came out last week, I think um, uh, when Guy on Espina did an official Information Act request and uh, found some document that, you know, Andrew Old, the head of public health, health in the ministry had advised against this policy. And the reason it has got to do with the way that tax works and GST works and GST is paid across a, a company's whole income across the whole year. So there is absolutely no guarantee that the reduction in price will be passed on. And in fact, it might be while this is publicly visible over the first couple of years, but I would predict that uh, this would give particularly the big supermarkets the opportunity to um, uh, bolster their loss leading approaches for unhealthy foods, and it may even have the direct opposite effect of what's intended. So I strongly disagree with this policy. Terrific. Actually got disagreement. <laughs> I like that. Um, okay. Um, uh, Te Pata Māori, Labour and National are all going um, to this election with proposals to broaden the age range for publicly funded cancer training. Pro uh, how about that for a sentence? Cancer screening programs. It's like the fee freeze one. Mm. Yeah. Um, who would like to comment on the wisdom of such changes? I'm happy to go. Yeah, Jim. On this app. Jamie, do you want to go first and then I'll follow you? Sure. Um, so I'll say that when we when I looked at uh, the extensions of the cancer screening programs, they move to match uh, where a lot of other countries internationally are in terms of cancer screening, um, both from everything from cervical cancer, moving it up to six, age 69, it's actually beyond where the US is at 65, um, extending breast cancer screening up from 69 uh, to 74. Um, and then, you know, it, by broadening out all of these screenings, we can do a better job of catching, you know, catching these diseases earlier. The, the challenge with doing that, and so in a lot of respects, I think this is a really good thing and it goes towards more preventative care. But the flip side of that is, is that the more that you screen, the more that you catch and you may catch things that are incidental findings, right? And so there's a, there has been, um, in the US, we expanded pretty broadly and made free all of our screening for a whole host of conditions under the US uh, preventative, task, uh, preventative Task Services. And what they found with that was that the overall cost, not only of screening went up, but also the cost of following up on screenings that things that were never gonna be found and were not actually likely to cause harm. So um, I think that we have to be aware of that. I think that we're probably under catching cancer right now and we're, we're, we're doing less than we should, but I think we should be aware of the follow-on effects here that we may end up spending more money in sort of things that would never cause harm in the future. And so just being able to balance that. Um, the other question is, if we catch these, if we catch this cancer earlier on, do we have appropriate ways to treat it on the back end? And so, really thinking about whether we can provide care um, once we do catch things. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think we are under screening for these cancers at the moment, but in um, increasing the age that we're looking at, we also need to have a corresponding increase in funding and resources for treating those cancers. Um, in particular for Māori health, Māori health researchers have been calling for a lower age in colorectal um, cancer screening for a long time because Ma 
the evidence shows that Māori um, are um, diagnosed, well, Māori have that disease and it progresses quicker at a much younger age than Pākehā New Zealanders. And so the current age that it's set at is really benefiting Pākehā New Zealanders and disadvantaging Māori and it's increasing inequities in that space. So I think widening the age is good, but I do still think there is scope there for having um, targeted ages for different population groups. Colin? Oh, uh, I agree about the potential benefits of uh, broadening the age uh, range. I, I just want to remind us that we had a conversation earlier about workforce uh, challenges a system that's uh, stretched we have to it's unethical to screen knowing that you can't offer people the treatment in a timely manner so uh, I, as i say i recognize the potential benefits of uh, of what is proposed but i think it's very important to be careful about uh, ex putting more people, telling people they've got some kind of serious uh, ailment and say, oh, by the way, we you have to linger on the waiting list for six months. And, you know, the attempt by the uh, working group for Te Whatuora to add a score for uh, ethnicity caused a huge outcry. So in other words, if we're not going to make these uh, uh, important decisions, uh, it's actually unethical to extend the screening knowing that we can't offer people the care that they deserve and need. Well, uh, I just think we need some evidence on it. So, I mean, what I'm hearing, and nobody's really said it, but it's because, you know, I'm here to say it, is we actually need to do some economic evaluation on this, right? So if you lower the screening age or you increase your screening age or you target your screening at Māori and Pacifica, what are the benefits and how much does it cost? And then modelling that through to how many resources do we need to deliver that? Um, and and I guess we can make that critique about many policies that are being put forward in the election, which is there is a lack of a lot of financial modelling and economic modelling to support them and just maybe a lot of hope um, that they'll find the money tucked underneath the sofa somewhere. Okay, so we are now going to swap over to um, audience questions. Um, so it's just been wonderful enough to uh, see the ones that uh, got the most draw and sent them through to me through the wonders of Wi-Fi. Um, and um, I'm just going to pretty much first come, first service on this one. Um, first question is um, a little bit more of a political one. Um, how strong a sway will ACT have in health? Um, their blindness, blindness to evidence and deafness to experts, especially on public health and prevention, really worries me. Anyone want to take that one? I would agree with that. I have to say that the... Um... The point earlier about Pharmac and productivity uh, linked uh, access is the stuff of nightmares. Uh, I, I just think this is uh, the wrong kind of messages to be sending to New Zealand. I'm sorry, I, I, I th I've never heard anything from this particular party that's remotely constructive. Uh, so that's... Uh, my reaction to that, Sarah. But, but I guess, you know, rightfully, given that I actually found a document with no typos in it, nicely formatted, um, I think we are right to be concerned. I haven't seen a document from many of the other parties with this much detail. Um, and, you know, they will, you know, should should that be the way the polls fall, they will have some say. And But I'm just not clear about what what they're going to give on, right? Mm. And I, th as a political scientist in the room, or one of them, um, we might have some views there too. Um, but um, yeah, it, I guess it would, would depend a bit on whether national is willing to sway that way as well or not. And uh, you know, it, not enough information to go on at the moment. So if they, if they are happy to pick up is this as an idea as a bargaining chip, or you know, they don't feel strongly about it. Um, yeah, there's a real danger, I think, in some of those those 
the things that people have talked about, um, there'd be other things that maybe National would hold the line on, um, but we don't know which is which yet. No, I think as a political scientist, I'm, I'm just going to actually say that, um, yeah, it depends. The, the poll on the day is the one that's going to matter. So we're going to be coming down to the line of... Um, of, of like how much bargaining power does ACT have in a potential coalition, depending on how close the results are, um, and, and New Zealand first, et cetera. Um, so that's part of it. On the other hand, um, as Tim Oncha mentioned right at the beginning, um, Labour and Tim, uh, Labour and Tim, Labour and National tend to be um, uh, incrementalists in this kind of space. So, um, it's like they're they're going to be massively risk averse, particularly in a very precarious situation. So yeah, I, I realize that's the typical academic answer of saying it depends, but um, it really does depend. But yes, it is, there's a lot to be concerned with, particularly given the detail in that report. Um, moving on to another question, uh, Te Akafai Ora states that it, it is indigenizing the health system. It often said that what works for Maori works for all. Is this truly reflective of Te Akafaora? I think that statement has been used quite a lot in the last 10 years to make an argument for um, why we need to take a kaupapa Māori approach within health services. So there are lots of areas where Māori approaches to providing and delivering health services has worked really well for all communities within Aotearoa New Zealand. And I'm thinking about COVID vaccination, primary health care. So, provide, um, you know, Māori health providers providing uh, low cost, high quality primary health care to communities um, out, that aren't just Māori, but also Pacifica, low income, refugee communities, migrant communities. I think that that statement needs to be given a chance to be proved right um, within our health system. I think that just establishing Te Akafaora one year in before they've even been able to make the difference that they're aspiring to make is really short-sighted in being able to do something different within our health system in Aotearoa New Zealand. We have different needs within our communities um, we have Te Tiriti o Waitangi as a constitutional document within our country. And I think Te Akafaura is an opportunity to do things differently and kind of set an example on the world stage of how we can improve Indigenous health within a colonial society by taking an Indigenous approach. And I don't see anything in what national actor are proposing that is actually going to be able to improve Māori health outcomes without Te Akafaura. Uh, I'll also add to that from again from a political science perspective um, that why do we need to justify uh, initiatives to improve the health of Māori by saying that they will also improve the lives of all? Isn't it uh, um, an inherent good if it just improves the lives and health of Māori? Um, so that framing is kind of interesting. Um, okay, any policies repay equity with Australia or incentives for practitioners to stay in New Zealand? Anyone want to touch this one? I guess I'll... <laughs> I, I, th I think, you know, th this, is, this is a game that we're not in a good position to win. So I think we have to, you know, not saying don't think about those sorts of policies, but, um, but if that becomes the nature of the game, uh, it's not a game that uh, New Zealand with our economy is, is, is going to win. So you might have to think about it a bit differently. That said, though, I do think I don't. I haven't seen anything that said anything about pay equity with Australia, but I do think that there is moves to try and increase um, at least general practitioners' pay and acknowledge that. I also think that there's um, policy initiatives that have been proposed that would, you know, offer payback of of student loans and things like that for nurses and other people if they agree to stay for at least five years and some things like that that have been helpful um, or you know inspiring people uh, additional. Uh, subsidies to inspire people to, to go into rural areas and different places. So I think there's efforts made in that direction, but um, nothing 
with respect to pay equity. And you can look at other things that, uh, as well as pay. I'm not saying don't look at pay, but there are other reasons people might want to prefer to work in, in Aotearoa uh, other than pay. And um, if that's our natural advantage, why not you know, sort of promote that? Okay, um, we're technically over time, but I'm actually going to extend things by just a little bit just to um, get through some additional questions because I think that's what you're here for. Um, admittedly, there are drinks outside, but um, I'm going to do the dangerous thing and stand between you and them. Um, okay, um, I have a mic. Um, okay, uh, what has been achieved um, by an additional 30% health spend over the last six years? Um, apart from reorganising secondary care? Well, that's not a very big part of that 30%. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, One of the lowest COVID death rates? Yeah. Worldwide? I mean, uh, I, I'm sure we have... I say this having spent 22, 22 years of those 30 away, but I'm sure while there are still inequities, they are smaller. Is that true? Hopefully. I think it's too soon to tell. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But, more yeah. aware. More. Yeah. I think we're more aware of the inequities, and um, in some areas they have reduced. So in um, lung cancer, smoking rates for Maori people, areas like um, Sudi, I mean, immunisation gains were quite big. They've dropped in the last five or six years. So um, I, I do think as well we need to recognise there was a significant underinvestment in health infrastructure by the previous national governments. I think you're being very generous, Esther. I mean, yes, except the uh, smoking reduction, but you know smoking is still more of a problem in Māori and Pacifica. Yes, so there's been a... But those bright lights are far and few between. Uh, and overall, the inequity problem in this country remains uh, extremely disappointing. What have we done about rheumatic fever? Yeah. If anything, that's a barometer for how good or how bad uh, things are. So I'm sorry to be a bit gloomy, but I think those bright prospects that you refer to are not anything to write home about. We have to get serious about inequities in Aotearoa. And so that's why I'm saying to Paula, uh, reduction where? Uh, because overall, my reading of the literature is uh, it's not very encouraging. Can I perhaps give a parallel example? So you may remember that um, in the UK, uh, there was a lot of new money in, um, uh, that went into the NHS in the early 2000s. Um, it took 15 years to see the result of that. Mm. Um, so, and that's usually what happens in this sort of situation. When you, particularly when you're playing ca catch up from a decade of underfunding, you won't see the results of the new money that's gone in um, for at least 15 years, in my view. And this is where I think as well, thinking of Te Aka Whaura and the impact on, on inequities, Colin, we need time to be able to show that a different way of doing things can reduce inequities and improve Māori health outcomes. I think this is, yeah, a turning the ship problem here, particularly. Um, okay, uh, a specific question. Do you anticipate parties having a significant influence on the emerging vape industry? Anyone want to take this? Top has, actually has a policy on this. Oh, okay. um, I know that, full stop. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much I can take in. Um, no, they do. They have, and they have a whole um, petition that you can sign. And so Top wants to basically get rid of all sale of, restrict the sale of vapes uh, to only being in pharmacies. So if, if your 14 year old wants to go in and get a vape, they got to face the pharmacist to do it, right? They want to take down, require vaping packets to be hidden from the public. So you can't see them. You have to get them from behind the counter. They have to have plain packaging, right? Nothing fancy, nothing fun. They also have to come in really boring and terrible flavors, not fruity and all kinds of things that kids like. Um, they also want to increase vaping cessation programs. So they've got this pretty solid, um, petition that they've put out to really do this. Now, the only other party that said anything about uh, vaping at all was labor, and they want to cap the number of vaping stores to 
at 600, so not allowing any new stores to open. They want to create a licensing scheme for it and harsher penalties to people that sell um, to kids up to about $15,000. Um, so that's kind of where people are, I think. But but for the most part, everybody else was a little bit silent on it. Um, so yeah, the top's got a good policy. And even Labor's policy, I think, just maintains the status quo. I know that my own Marae has a vape store that opened up around the corner and Fano in our community stand outside it to discourage our young people from going in and spending their money at that vape store. And so many, many communities are crying out for more support in this. And I think um, capping what the stores we already have isn't going to make the impact we need. I think TOPS, their policy is the only one that really looks at curbing the epidemic of vaping. I totally agree. I also think getting it out of dairies and is, is really important because kids go into dairies all the time after school for all kinds of things. And so getting it just out of there um, is a really important piece of it. Yeah, I also think oh. just going to the door next door to the dairy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I've noticed, um, particularly, um, I don't know how many of you live in the center city. Um, I do. Um, and I've noticed a lot of convenience stores creating little nooks, yeah. separate little nooks for that are specifically vape stores. So this this model at like labor where you're setting a cap on the number of stores, you can see this rush now to create stores um, uh, as before this, this any potential cap could be set in place. Um, so I find that particularly interesting. Okay, last question that's been sent through. Um, this one apparently is pretty popular. Um, what are the chances of any party introducing a tax in sugary drinks or junk food? Um, would would this improve oral health? Um, uh, in, in, and um, would this pay for free dental care? Oh, was that a hard... Boyd... Oh, sorry, Paula. No, it's fine. I was just pointing out that Boyd had left, but he probably posed the question. <laughs> hmm. I was at a Heart Foundation event and Shane Reddy categorically said uh, it's not the business of uh, governments to decide for people. Uh, um, and, and you know Labour hasn't been keen at all and they keep referring to the lack of evidence. Uh, the evidence from many countries around the world is pretty good. So there's obviously other reasons why it's not being... Uh, uh, entertained I think we should uh, the Pacific Islands almost all of them have introduced uh, tax on soft drinks and it clearly made an impact on consumption so why we're dragging our feet I have no idea well, the reason why we're dragging our feet is that the food industry is strong enough lobby that they will never um, um, well I'd say never allow it. the only way I can see it happening is if National takes the lead, as, as the Conservatives did in, in England. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if Labor went out and proposed it, they'd get, they'd get bashed. Mm -hmm. um, if Na National did, it would give Labor the opportunity to come in behind. Mm -hmm. So the only hope I see, actually, I, um, paradoxically, is if National's in power. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to vote for them on that basis, but, <laughs> but I, I think this is the way this sort of stuff tends to work okay um we have come to the end of the audience question so um i'm going to hand back to tim to um wrap things up um thank you very much oh thank you all for your um wonderful questions that came through at the end i think that that really um gave us uh, quite a bit of a lift at the end because um we're kind of running out of our own steam, weren't we? I was anyway. <laughs> but thank you. Um, I'd like to close with a, um, a karakia. Um, unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapu nui. Kia wātia, kia mama, kia nākau, te tinana, te wairua, i te ara takata. Koia rā e rongo, whakaevria, ake ki runga. Kia tina, tina. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the event and hope you learned a few things or um, and uh, look forward to joining you, many of you, 
you uh, you're invited for drinks and nibbles outside. Okay, just out in the in the foyer. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Takoto. Thanks, Esther. Thank you, to Colin. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Colin. No, thank you. It was really fun. I wish I was there. Great buzz. Okay. Afterwards, but we'll see you around. Yes.